Thank you, Dennis. Good evening, everybody. Good to see everyone tonight. We're really glad that you've uh, joined us. I appreciate so much you being here on a cold Wednesday night in January. It speaks volumes about your love for the Lord, your desire to uh, study from His Word, the value you place on Christian fellowship, even behind the masks. And um, I thank you for that. And those that are watching online, thank you for taking time out of your busy week to join us for this time of Bible study and reflection. I hope it will be a blessing to you. Tonight we're going to be talking about the sovereignty of God, uh, particularly as it is pictured in the book of Proverbs, although probably for the lesson tonight, I'm going to go more outside the book of Proverbs than on some of the other lessons that we're doing in this series. Now, if you've got a handout on Proverbs, let me tell you there's a little bit of a change tonight, and that is that I'm probably going to only be dealing with about the first three sections of that handout tonight. The other sections on God, God's opposition to evil, we touched on that briefly last week, as well as God's desire to comfort those who are uh, in need, whether it be widows or orphans. We also talked about that some last week. And then next week, we're going to look at the things that God hates. Did you know that God actually hates some things? Well, according to the book of Proverbs, he certainly does. There are things that God hates, and we'll explain that in further detail next week. But tonight, I want us to think about this idea of sovereignty. Let me preface it in this way. I know that we are concerned about the world in which we live on many fronts. I know that we're concerned about the pandemic that not only is affecting our country, but countries around the world. I understand that Brazil and South Africa are two major hot spots right now. But not only with regard to our health, but the violence that we see throughout the world. It's not just in our country, but violence is taking place around the world. And when you think about some of the political violence that we've witnessed here in our nation in the last month, folks, that's nothing. It is nothing compared to what goes on regularly in countries around the world. And when you think about governments, around the world, governments are in a continual state of turmoil and flux. We have become so accustomed in our nation today to the stability, and really it is the stability that our government has endured for so many decades and even centuries that we sometimes forget how rare that is on a worldwide basis because so many nations continually change governments and have coups and uh, revolts. And this is something that just goes on constantly. And I know that we're concerned also about the moral values of our nation, the things that we see regularly in the media and we even hear in music, and uh, the things that just permeate our society today. I know all of these are things that concern us greatly. It's easy for us, I think, to feel overwhelmed. Do you ever feel that way? Do you ever just feel like the world is closing in on us? And you just wonder how much more we can take? I think a lot of Christians feel that way. Tonight, I want to present the other side of that coin. And it is the side that gives us hope. It's the side that gives us peace. 
It's the side of the coin that helps us to realize no matter how bad things may get in this world, we have a God who is sovereign. Now, to begin this, I really want to go over to um, uh, the book of uh, 1 Timothy. Let's see which, what works better here for me, with or without the glasses tonight from this distance. Okay, I'm going to go with. <laughs> you ever have that problem? Do I wear them or not wear them? Okay. First Timothy, we're going to actually go here to chapter 6. These are the last words of this particular letter, uh, the first letter that Paul wrote to Timothy, and they comprise what is known as a doxology. Paul would often be, uh, end his letters with a word of praise, and that's exactly what this is. It is almost like a hymn. You know, we sing a hymn that we call the doxology, praise God, from whom all blessings flow, praise him all creatures here below. Well, this is Paul's doxology here as he concludes his letter to uh, Timothy. And listen to what he says. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality, and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see. To him be honor and dominion, uh, an eternal dominion. Amen. Now right there we get an idea of this, this thing called sovereignty. He begins with that word, to him who is the only and blessed sovereign. So let's talk for just a moment. What do we mean when we talk about a sovereign being? Number one, we're talking about one who is singular in number. And Paul spells that out. God is the only sovereign, the, 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 the title sovereign. The adjective sovereign by its very nature means only one. You cannot have two sovereigns. Remember that back in the Old Testament, the Jewish idea of one God was very rare in ancient times. Monotheism, only one God. You remember Deuteronomy chapter 6. Uh, verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But we know that many of the peoples in ancient times believed in many gods. I'm going to mention in just a few moments, I'll probably come back to it here, but Paul, as he preached in Athens in Acts chapter 17, came into the city that Luke described as being full of idols. Everywhere he turned, there were idols to pagan gods. In fact, they were so worried that they might offend a god or leave one out, they actually, there in Athens, had built an altar to the unknown god whom Paul said, I declare unto you. Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32 describe how the Gentiles had neglected God, how they had rejected God, even though he had revealed his eternal power and his divine nature by the things that had been created. But yet they had rejected the idea of God, and ultimately because they rejected the idea of God, and they, uh, instead of worshiping the Creator, they worshiped created things. God gave them up and gave them over to depraved minds. So God is the only sovereign. The singularity uh, here in terms of 
of uh, number, singularity of number. Number two, it speaks of superiority, superiority uh, in status. Notice what, uh, how Paul describes that here in 1 Timothy chapter 6. The king of kings and the Lord of lords. Does that phrase ring a familiar tune to you? Nearly all of us have heard Handel's Messiah, King of kings and Lord of lords. Yeah, right here. And also, that is obviously also found over in the book of Revelation as well. King of kings and Lord of lords. So not only the uh, 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 singularity in number, but superiority in, uh, in terms of uh, status. And then number three, there it is, uh, speaks of the source of immortality. He alone, immortal, immortality. So the source of immortality. And then number four, the one who is worthy of praise and exaltation. To him be eternal dominion, eternal presence, eternal power. Amen. Now let me kind of uh, deviate away from my slides here for just a moment. And let's talk a little bit more about the sovereignty of God. What is a good definition of sovereignty? Can anybody think of one? How would you define that word sovereign? Anybody have any ideas that you'd like to mention on that tonight? Let me throw out a couple of ideas, a couple of words for you. Power and authority. A sovereign being is one who has power and authority to the degree that it outweighs all other power and authority. A sovereign being possesses power and authority to the degree that it overshadows and outweighs any other power or authority. See if I can illustrate it like this. Here in the United States, we have power and authority in terms of government, right? We have local power and authority. We have a local city government. We have a local county government. But then we have a Authority that is really over that, do we not? We have a state government, power, invested in our governor, in the legislature, in uh, organizations like the Arkansas State Police and other uh, 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 law enforcement uh, branches, power and authority. But is that the highest power and authority in our country? No. You go a little bit further up the ladder, and what do we have? We have the federal government. We have a Congress. You have the uh, legislative, the executive, the judicial branches of the federal government, and you can take all of those on up between the congressmen and the senators, and then you can go up to the president, and then in the judicial branch, you even go as far as what we call the Supreme Court. But is the Supreme Court really the supreme being? No. No. Now, in terms of the laws of the land, yes, according to the Constitution. But there is one who is higher than that. And that is God himself. And that's why over in Acts 5, 29, you've got this passage where after Peter and John had been warned by the Jewish council to not preach the gospel anymore, Peter making the statement, we must obey God rather than man. Because Peter recognized there was one who was a higher authority. And we need to recognize that as well today. And our allegiance as Christians is first and foremost 
to that higher authority, God, who is, as Paul writes here in 1 Timothy 6, he is the only sovereign. I think there are several passages that bear this out. Uh, and one of the reasons my mind kind of went to this as I was uh, preparing for the lesson tonight is because of the study we've been doing on Sunday mornings regarding Job. And there's a passage at the end of Job uh, this past Sunday morning, and I just, you know, I, 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 after that sermon was over, I just thought, man, <laughs> there are times you just, you just want to know, could I do a repeat on that sometime? Because I just felt like I just didn't do it justice at all. But in Job 42, verse 2, there's a statement that I really believe sums up the idea of sovereignty. Job says, I know that you can do all things and your purpose will not be thwarted. Think about that. After all Job had been through and, and uh, all that he had endured, and you remember he wanted to speak with God and argue with God, and then in chapters 38 through 41, God speaks to Job about how he had created the earth and how he had created all of the animals and, and, uh, and even the great animals of the earth. And he had established all of this, this, the stars and the Pleiades and the constellations and all of these things in the heavens. And when he gets through, Job is just feeling like this tiny little creature and, and Job says, now I understand. You can do, there, there's nothing you cannot do. And your plans, your power cannot be thwarted. That is sovereignty. Recognizing God's sovereignty. You come on over a little bit further to uh, the book of Isaiah, chapter 49 and verse 6. There God says, I alone am God. I, I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is only one. That's it. God doesn't share top billing with anybody. God alone is sovereign. He doesn't share, doesn't share the marquee with anyone. Remember back in um, Exodus chapter 3 when uh, God appeared to Moses at the burning bush. And Moses said, Lord, who, who are you? And God does God is so sovereign, he really he doesn't even have to explain himself to Moses. He said, Moses, I am. I am. I am that I am. To be, I am. I just I am. Somebody said God is the only I am being. All the rest of us are in the process of becoming something. But God is the only I am being. And that is reflective of his sovereignty. Over in the book of Daniel, a couple of passages, in Daniel chapter 4, verse 4, Nebuchadnezzar recognized the sovereignty of God at that point when he says his kingdom is an eternal kingdom. And of his dominion, there is no end. God's kingdom is an eternal kingdom. And you and I are part of that kingdom, the church. It's an eternal kingdom without end. And then later on in verse 35 of Daniel 4, the idea of sovereignty, once again, uh, Daniel, uh, or rather, uh, Daniel acknowledges that God exerts his authority over the heavenly hosts as well as the inhabitants of the earth. 
And one more from Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. He's redeemed us according to the uh, according to his own purpose, the, the um, power of his own purpose, God's sovereignty. Now, how does that play out in Scripture? Well, notice a few things here. Uh, let's go on to the, um, to the next slide. How does God's sovereignty play out in the world in which we live? Well, first of all, he is the creator of the heavens and the earth. And the first slide I've got here is actually one I used a few weeks ago from uh, Proverbs chapter 3, uh, verses 19 and 20, where there the writer says, The Lord by wisdom founded the earth. By understanding, he um, established the heavens. By his knowledge, the deeps were broken up and the skies drip with dew. There, how is God's sovereignty demonstrated? I want you to remember his wisdom, his knowledge, his understanding, and the role that these play in creation. His wisdom, by his wisdom, the earth was founded. By his uh, understanding, the heavens were created. And by knowledge, the deeps were broken up and the skies dripped with dew. This is a theme that is repeated not only here in the book of Proverbs, but it's also repeated by the prophets and also uh, in the book of Psalms. Go to the next slide that has Jeremiah chapter um, 10, verses 12 and 13. And notice this one. Let me hold this up where I can see it just a little bit better. Okay. It is he who has made the earth by his uh, by his power, who um, who established the wor the world by wisdom. There's the idea of wisdom. I talked about wisdom and knowledge and understanding. He established the world by wisdom, and by his understanding, he stretched out the heavens. And when he um, when he utters his words or his voice, there is a tumult, tumult of water. Get that one right? A tumult of water in the heavens. So you get the same idea of God's sovereignty through his wisdom, his knowledge, and his, um, his understanding. Look here from Psalm chapter 104, verse 24. O oh Lord, how many, <clears throat> how many are, are, your, are your works in wisdom? You have made them, in wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your possessions. Sorry about that. <clears throat> so, stop and think about all that God has made. I wish I um, could have put some pictures up of the constellations and the stars and the universe, but just use your imagination just a little bit of what's being talked about here. God in his sovereignty created the heavens. There is no way for us to fathom how broad our universe is. We live in a solar system that has um, about eight or nine planets, depending on whether or not they're counting Pluto this week. I sometimes hear of Pluto being counted as a planet, and then sometimes I hear that, no, it's, it's not really a planet. And then, so I don't, I don't know where it is exactly in, in modern uh, uh, astronomy, but uh, we have this solar system. It's our little neighborhood that is a part of a much broader community of stars and planets known as the Milky Way. 
our galaxy. And you know, if you're out on a, a clear night and uh, uh, away from the lights of the city, you can look up sometimes and you can just see the, the, the bands of the Milky Way. How many stars do you suppose are in our galaxy? Does anybody know? Anybody heard a count lately? <laughs> Terry, I it may be right. 200 billion? It may be. I don't know. I mean, I'm just throwing that out there. I don't think anybody really knows. For, I mean, there's no way to tell. Now, stop and think about this. Not only that, but then we're told that our galaxy, the Milky Way, is just one of millions and millions or billions of galaxies. I mean, uh, uh, yeah, within the universe. <laughs> there used to be a city councilman in Memphis years ago, and his favorite expression was, that boggles my mind. Well, it does. We can't comprehend it. Do you know why I'm convinced the universe is so big? It is created by the sovereignty of God as a testimony of how big God is. That's why the universe is so big. Humanism wants to reduce mankind down to this significant, uh, 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 it, rather insignificant peon creature in this infinite universe. But the Bible says that we are created in the image of God, male and female, Genesis 1, 28 and 29, and I believe the reason we have this expanse of universe is as a testimony to the one who has created us. Because that's exactly what Psalm 19 says. The heavens declare the glory of God. Sovereignty. Sovereignty. How you can... Look up into the starry sky and just somehow think that this is just some freak cosmic collision of gases that just happen to have occurred. As Carl Sagan would have said billions and billions of years ago, I'm sorry, I don't buy that. I'm not sorry. I, I, but I don't buy that. That's what the writer of Proverbs is trying to get us to see. And God's sovereignty is extended throughout nature. We see it even in Scripture. We see God's sovereignty over nature demonstrated. Think about the plagues in uh, Egypt back in the opening chapters of the book of Exodus whether you're talking about the plagues of the, the flies or the, the, uh, the, uh, the Nile turning to blood or the flies, the frogs, or whatever it may have been, God's sovereignty over nature, the miracles Jesus performed, turning water into wine, John chapter 2, sovereignty over the very elements of nature, Think about God's sovereignty in the lives of individuals like Joseph and how God worked throughout Joseph's life to bring about an intended purpose. And over in Genesis chapter 50, when Joseph's brothers feared for their lives after the death of Jacob, Joseph said, I know that you meant it for evil, but what? God meant it for what? Good. Isn't that sovereignty? Isn't that God using history and people and events to accomplish his overriding purpose? 
Absolutely. We've seen it in the life of Job. Job didn't understand what was going on in his life, but God had his hand on the wheel the whole time to prove his purpose and his will. And we could just go on and on and on uh, like that. Okay, <clears throat> let me move on to the, uh, to the next slide here for just a moment. Psalm um, 103, verse 19. Somebody read that one for me. One of you men, would you, somebody read that. Nick, you here tonight? How about just reading that from where you sit? Okay, Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his sovereignty rules over all. That's a good passage to mark in your Bible, folks. When you kind of feel like the world is getting out of control, you just remember his sovereignty rules over all. And God has also created uh, man, mankind, and he is sovereign in the affairs of man. I've got two passages here, uh, both of which I think I actually used last week. The first one here uh, from Pro Proverbs 22, the, um, the rich man, <clears throat> excuse me, the rich and the poor have this uh, common bond. The Lord is the, uh, the maker of both of them. If only we would realize that in the world, that all of us, regardless of whether we're rich or poor, whether we're educated, uneducated, whatever our status in life, whatever our nationality, our ethnicity, folks, if we would all recognize and submit to the sovereignty of God, it would, it would, eliminate so many of the difficulties that we face. Where one group tries to pit themselves against another, if we could only understand that all of us are subject to the sovereignty of God. And likewise, um, the next passage here talks about over in Proverbs chapter 29 and uh, verse 30, the poor man and the oppressor have this in common. The Lord gives an, uh, <clears throat> the Lord gives light to the eyes of both of them. God is the one who blesses all of us, whether we're rich or poor, uh, the folks who are subjected to oppression and the oppressor, it is God who gives us life and the one who gives us uh, the blessings of this world in which we live. So I hope we'll take these things tonight um, as we uh, think about the world in which we live. And when you stop, uh, when you start feeling a little bit discouraged, as many of us have been lately, I think, you kind of start feeling a little bit overwhelmed by the events and the circumstances of this life, I want you to remember this lesson about the sovereignty of God, that he is in control of his creation, and that includes the universe, it includes the, uh, the powers and authorities, and it includes your life. Two final illustrations, and we'll conclude. <clears throat> Jesus, Ma uh, Matthew chapter 8, is in a boat out on the Sea of Galilee at night. When I went to Israel uh, about 20 years ago now, our tour group took a nighttime boat ride on the Sea of Galilee. The only difference was it wasn't a stormy night. Our night was clear. You could see the lights along the shore of 
Galilee, and you can see the city of Tiberias uh, with its bright lights on the western shore. It was still a fascinating time to be in that small boat, and we paused there in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, and we had a devotional. We sang the song, Master, the Temptest is Raging, and it just kind of sent shivers up my spine as we sang that. But I was re we were reminded of the account here in Matthew chapter 8 where suddenly there was a storm that erupted and the disciples became afraid. Now these were men who were seagoing men for the most part. They had spent their lives around the Sea of Galilee. Some of them like Peter and Andrew and James and John had made their living on the Sea of Galilee. And then suddenly this storm comes up and these guys are acting like a bunch of scaredy cats. They are afraid for their lives. It had to have been a violent storm. This was not just a mild thunderstorm. This was violent. And Jesus is calmly asleep in the floor of the boat and they wake him, and they're saying, Master, don't you care that we are about to perish? That's how afraid they were. What did Jesus do? He got up. He said three words. Do you remember what they were? Peace, be still. And suddenly, the sea was as smooth as glass. The wind subsided. The rain stopped. The sky cleared. And the apostles are looking at each other and they're saying, what manner of man is this? that even the winds and the waves obey him. Well, I'll tell you what manner of man it was. Sovereign. He was God in the flesh. And he was sovereign over the winds and the waves. And that's why Jesus could say in Matthew 10, 29, not even a single sparrow falls to the earth, but what your Father in heaven knows. And if you're worried that God doesn't know what's taking place in your life, go out and buy yourself a bird and put it in a cage. And if God knows what that bird's up to, I'll assure you, he knows what you're doing. Let's pray. Almighty, you are sovereign over all the world, over the universe that your hands have created over the earth that you've formed by wisdom and understanding and knowledge, over our very lives, you are sovereign. And tonight in as humble a way as we know how, we seek to acknowledge that sovereignty and we seek to humble ourselves obediently before your throne. We thank you, Father, for who you are in the midst of a tumultuous world. We thank you for being the God who is in control of all things. You know what you're doing and ultimately you are the victor. Through Jesus we pray, amen. Folks, hope you have a great night tonight. God bless for the rest of the week. Casey's going to be preaching Sunday. I'll be around, not playing hooky totally, but I'm going to take a Sunday out of the pulpit this coming Sunday. So Casey will be uh, speaking this coming Sunday. God bless.